intro since you're really the man. I'm just a guest star on your fucking show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever, Gary. Um, <laughs> good morning, everyone. Thank you. Uh, and welcome to Coffee and Commerce, the show that uh, intends to and our vision is to push the commerce conversation forward. So we're super excited to have Salesforce's chief digital evangelist, Vala Afshar, with us today. Thanks for joining Vala, us, Vala. Vala, Vala, you and I have been you know, real life friends, we've interacted a couple times, unbelievable Twitter buddies for a decade here. So why don't you take the first two minutes, take the floor and tell everybody what that means, that of what you actually do at Salesforce. And then even, why don't we even do two or three minutes on your origin story of how you got there? Because I think, you know, knowing my audience, which is obviously a high percentage of the people watching here, uh, I think that'll bring some value uh, to the audience. And then, um, and then we'll get into some nitty gritty of the state of the union. Uh, from uh, Zubin and I and your perspective. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, I, I went to school and studied electrical engineering. So I started my career as a software developer and uh, an introvert, always uh, fighting imposter syndrome, happy to sit and just write code. And uh, But uh, eventually uh, my career led uh, to running engineering at a technology firm. And then the CEO of the company said, I want to bring some discipline you have in engineering on the service and support side of the house. And this was a $500 million annual revenue company. And so he asked me to run services. This was in 2003. I had no idea what a CRM was. I had no idea what tools you needed to run service. So I, I researched uh, a few of us and we found this West Coast company, a couple of hundred people at the time called Salesforce. And we brought them into our company. Salesforce helped triple the size of my company. When I joined Salesforce, the company was a billion in revenue. And uh, I was the chief marketing officer at the time. And I ended up writing a book about CRM. I ended up writing articles. I fell in love with social. You're the reason why I fell in love with social. I and didn't know. I didn't know that. Uh, uh, I didn't know that. I didn't know. So, that. Please. so I, I'm a I'm a customer of Salesforce at Dreamforce in 2011, August 2011. Now I joined Twitter in 2011. So at that time, I've got a couple of hundred followers, and I think a couple of them are my parents. Right. So really, I have no network. I, I think I'm so small. You send a DM to me on the first day of Dreamforce saying, I'm going to be at the keynote area. I'd like to meet you. Of course, I, you know, it's, I've, I've read the trust economy. I've, you know, I've read your book. That, you know, I, I, I'm following you on Twitter. But you have hundreds of thousands of followers. You're a verified account. I have no idea. By the way, to this date, I have no idea why you had the generosity. To I actually remember that. Out. I have a funny meeting. I, I'm funny. I remember that event very clearly because I wasn't on the main stage, I was in a separate room. And while I was prepping, yes. I was looking at everybody who was talking about the event and literally just being a gracious person and saying hello. I like people. It's the first time, first life lesson, networking is about giving. There was, I had, you, I had shocked, you had shocked my system. That a, that a celebrity thought leader is just randomly wants to meet me. Again, I, 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 you know, I, I didn't have a footprint. And so you, it, it was just unbelievably surprising to me. So I come and meet you and you ask me about my origin, my, my name. And I'm like, I'm a, a refugee immigrant. And you say to me, so I tell him I, I was born in Iran. There was a war. I had to immediately leave. It was a crisis. And, and, and the most disruptive thing in your life, whether you do it by choice or your force is leaving your birth country. And you said, listen, first of all, you grabbed my arm and then you rolled up your sleeve and you said, look at my goosebumps. And then I'm looking, I'm like, oh my God, I, how, you connected with me with such a visceral way by grabbing my arm and showing the goosebumps. And you said, my family immigrated in 1978 from Belarus and my family was at a, at a borderline, at a border and with military protection. And we had to border with flour for bread. And that's the permission that we, so it was a bag of bread that saved it, my family's life. It's, a, it's, a, it's slightly different, but you got the genesis of it. Israel and America traded wheat to wheat. Russia yeah. to let some Jews out. That was it. Yeah. Like, you know, it's just, it's unbelievable. Insane. None, nonetheless. It's un unbelievable. So, so, so that's so that when hit, I that realized hit, that hit, that the hit power you. of, uh, it, it, it hit me in, well, I, you know how often I share your content. I mean, you, you're masterful at genuinely connecting. I remember you sent like a 15 second video to me years after. I remember that. And the video was like, I really, I really like what you share on social. And I'm sitting there going, what, like what simple, brilliant, <laughs> you know, I, and, and when I, when I say like connected with me, like 
you know, I don't, I have your material around my house that reminds me about the grind, the work, the gratitude, the mindset of giving without expecting a get, give, give, give seven times before you make an ask. I mean, these are like common and the key, sense. And the, key, and the key for everybody watching, I know we're going a little high level here, Subin, but I know you love it. No, I love it's, it. I love you, Bala, because you're hearing me. Because not ask, not take, not get, ask. And then the real key is give, 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 ask. Person doesn't reciprocate and don't worry about it. Because that's where people, people fake give and then expect and they're devastated when they don't, when they didn't even really give. My belief is that giving is giving. Sure, there's times to ask, yeah. but if the person doesn't reciprocate, all that giving I did did not require that person to give back to me. I gave for the sake of giving, you know, the end. And most people are crippled. Hugely by important. Them. Hugely, it's why people don't Hugely give. Important. They're crippled. Yeah. And, and most people confuse giving with manipulating. God, so many people try to give right. to me when they're full of shit. They're trying to give me something that I don't want in return for me to give something they want when I have all the leverage. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, see that's, and I, I don't know if it's because us three immigrants recognize that the world doesn't owe you anything. Like that <laughs> sense of entitlement is what cripples entrepreneurs, founders, business leaders, especially when you climb the success ladder, although I don't believe in ladders. I think when you help people, you become the ladder. But, but at the end of the day, this notion of the world doesn't owe you anything. If you want something, you work for it. But I got to tell you that I didn't have that realization until my 40s. When I met you in 2011, I was 41 years old. So I, I don't know if it was my parents, my teachers, my managers. I had this silo mentality. And that silo mentality was consume resources, protect those resources, and extract as much value as you can from those resources. So I thought the lifeblood of your success, your company individual was just capturing. Now, by the way, at that time, I'm a chief marketing officer. I have hundreds of people that work for me. I have a hundred million dollar budget. So I was actually doing a decent job of collecting, but it was the first tweet. It was meeting you. It was the book, the articles where I realized the lifeblood is movement of resources. The reason why we have passion for sharing is because I spent 40 years learning, consuming knowledge, resource knowledge, and then using that to better myself. But I didn't take that extra step of sharing what I knew. And the, I, I, would not, I wouldn't be a chief digital evangelist at Salesforce, the first evangelist that the company hired, if it wasn't for the love of sharing. And I'm telling you, you played, and I don't say it enough, I should, you played a massive role in opening my eye in terms of the goodness of giving. And you just did it so naturally, like it's, I, 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 I remember like it was yesterday. Thank you for that. Zubin? I mean, what could I <laughs> Tom do? Yeah. Tom show, thank I, you. yeah. Uh, <laughs> we'll see you next time on Coffee and Commerce. Uh, no, look, Gary, you asked me a few episodes ago, you said, what is the one thing that surprised me about working at Vayner and, and about you, frankly? And one of the things that I said is the appreciation people have of you um, not people that are just getting started, people that are established, people that are incredibly successful in what they do, like Vala. And I think that's kind of the thing that's really important for people that look at you as a role model and say, okay, what does he do? How can I do it, right? Everybody does it differently. But in terms of the genuinity and giving, 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 and ultimately, if you receive, great. If not, there, it's not a zero sum It's not game. why you did it. You can continue, exactly. It's not why you did it. Yeah. yeah. You know, but, it's not, it's, yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was gonna say, like, you know, it's funny. This first time I've ever realized this, I'm like, ooh, this is the insight to why I don't talk about my nonprofit work. You know, like when I do business, like I talk about bit, like when I do business, I'm like, hey, buy this baseball card. Da, 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 da. You know, I do business. Yeah. But when I'm giving, you know, I real so many people give back in charity to position themselves as a good person. It's a proxy. It's a strategic move. They're not giving for the sake of giving. They're giving because it's gonna make them look good. Oh, you're a great person. Oftentimes hiding something bad. You know, so like, it just, it literally just right now, I'm like, right. This is the same fucking reason that I don't, that I'll, I'll go there occasionally, but it's just not my normal state. Listen, we've gone very high level in the first 15 minutes. I wanna really go, I want you to kind of take control here, Zubin. You know, Salesforce is such a real player in this space. Let's let's go in some, sure. some tactics. What, what kind of questions do you have in mind for Bala? Yeah, so look, um, we we talk about e-commerce obviously all the time. We talk about omni-channel, we talk about all these things. Um, that's our area of expertise, that's where we focus. Um, and, and what we wanna do is bring 
different voices into the conversation, right? We're continually talking about Shopify and we have a great relationship with them. Volumet Salesforce and Salesforce Commerce Cloud, they have a different type of client. They have different types of clients, frankly. Um, and so it's great to hear from different perspectives, right? What we see in the marketplace is that there is kind of horizontal growth, vertical growth happening in the marketplace. And it's just great for our audience to be able to hear from experts like Vala in the space about a few things. One, content, right? Gary talks about content all the time. Vala's posting a lot of content, uh, but Vala writes a lot of content as well. He's got his own show. Talk to us about content and how that has actually impacted your business at Salesforce. And then the other thing, obviously, that we want to get into. Let's is, stay right there. Let's oh, stay right yeah, there. Let's stay right there for a second. Yeah, content is, uh, you know, so so I do research. I, 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 I'm a speaker. I, I, I'm active on social and I write. I write for mostly ZDNet because it has a technology audience. They're owned by CBS Interactive. So when I could, when I stopped traveling in the first week of March, I decided that I'm going to write more. Uh, you know, I log into Twitter before, you know, in February, Twitter Analytics. And it says, you know, 70 million impressions every 28 days. I've written 65 articles since March. So I'm writing three, four articles uh, a week. And now it's 150 million impressions every 28 days. So people are consuming the content. Uh, no question. Now, as far as, you know, commerce, um, you know, we started doing scenario planning in, in late February, Salesforce. Uh, you know, working with, you know, partners, uh, customers, uh, employees, partners like Accenture, Deloitte, PwC. We wanted to bring some experts in terms of understanding the impact of pandemic because we've never in our lifetime have gone from centralized to distributed digital model. So this construct is completely new to all of us. And I will say, you know, adopting a beginner's mindset is critical because I don't believe they're experts of tomorrow. Uh, it's just this just new norm, next norm is going to be vastly different um, and for, for many reasons. So the scenario planning uh, led to us believing that we could be in this state for three years, 18 months to three years, short, short, short window, 18, long window, three, three years, meaning in the absence of doing 67 million tests a day, in the absence of herd immunity, in the absence of automated contact tracing, not manual or zero, and then vaccine, uh, you're, uh, you're going to have uh, two more factors that define discretionary spend at any level, individual to big business. Prior COVID, discretionary spend had relevance was the main criteria in terms of how you spend your hard-earned dollars. In the climate we are today, where you have a health crisis, you have an economic crisis, you have a race crisis, and frankly, you have a lack of leadership crisis. Uh, crisis. So there's a trust deficit. Uh, Gary talked about you know the fine line between manipulating and, and inspiring, and that fine line is defined by your intent, your motive, motivation. And today, right now, in this country, people don't trust institutions. They don't trust leaders at the highest level. The leadership is as invisible as the virus itself right now. And that's why we're one of the worst performing countries in the world in terms of combating. So in this three years means companies that can remove friction, knowing convenience always wins, and understanding that the two other criteria on top of relevance is safety. Like, I'm a father of three. I'm not going to a movie theater. I'm not going to a mall. I'm not going to, unless I understand that the safety measures are in place, uh, you know, social distancing, wearing a mask, cleaning the environment. So all of this means that in my opinion, we've witnessed probably five years of social and cultural transformation just in the last five months. Five years of transformation. Now, if you look at US retail in terms of just e-commerce, we went from about eight to 15% of total retail commerce being digital. And it took 10 years to get that doubling effect. I wouldn't be surprised if we end calendar 2020, where digital commerce is 30% of total retail. So you've looked at 10 years of acceleration of adopting digital commerce, contactless payments, order online, pickup, curbside, uh, you know, all of these measures to ensure safety and the last thing, by the way, is, 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 is not just safety, it's accessibility. There's certain businesses that, that can't open, frankly, and you've seen a lot of states not going back to phase one, given the explosive. We had 71,000 positive cases yesterday. That was a record. According to Dr. Fauci, we might enter August with 100,000 new cases a day. Now, what that means is that if you're a business and you're not investing in commerce, you're not removing friction, you're not taking advantage of the, the mindset where safety and accessibility is now really driving discretionary spend, you're gonna be out of business. Now, fortunately for companies like yours and my companies like mine, 
folks that are pioneering you know, e-commerce, both on the B2B and B2C side, and really taking advantage of innovation, like machine learning that powers that personalization at scale, that's taking commerce to a level where you don't even feel like you're sold to. You, the, the, the advice is like a Netflix recommendation or a Spotify song. It's like, yeah, I do need this. Uh, it, it's amazing how the science of understanding an individual embedded in commerce with the power of community where word of mouth and social can really drive I, you're going to see commerce is going to be uh, a, a really a do or die capability. I don't care what size business. I don't care what geography. I don't care what industry. Now, the sad part is I was talking to a CEO of a $500 million company yesterday, yesterday. And she said, I had to shut off my e-commerce because my supply chain back end couldn't keep up with the demand. So we're missing on our promise and it's affecting our brand. And I, I'm like, I can't. She was so frustrated that she's running a half a billion dollar company, but she doesn't have the complete view of the commerce business, understanding that if you don't integrate with your back office, if you don't understand your persona of your buyers and you're not adapting, like I'm a guy that buys, you know, black, gray, you know, blue clothing. So when I come to your commerce side, if you don't have my buying uh, behavior in the past and you start showing me yellow, red, pink, Totally. Just understanding male, extra large, and color preference, and you sort the content based on my prior purchase history, you're going to have two order of magnitude in terms of improving shopping cart abandons and increasing your, your, your retention and acquisition. So, again, I felt so bad for the CEO because some people feel like, oh, tweaking a website, and that's it. That's the commerce, you know, you're ready to go. And they don't realize that there's a science to this. And the science is getting more sophisticated and you're going to lose market share if you don't understand that speed, relevance, personalization, personalization at scale, powered by intelligence, is the only way you can compete and win. And that's why Amazon's market share is more than the 10 retailers that compete with combined. Combined. So anyway, sorry, that was a long answer. But no, it's the... It, it, you know, commerce, look, we're, commerce we're, is vital. We are, it, it's so vital that if you sell something and you don't spend... 80% of your mental energy to be the best in the world in your sector on the commerce, e-commerce side of it, you're completely misunderstanding the moment that we live in. You're misunderstanding. Right. You know, you, because it doesn't go backwards. To your point, whatever one day when the data is a little clearer, COVID has done to expand and accelerate, whether it's three years or 30 years or five years, it's clearly something you have to be completely you know, asleep to think it's not. More importantly, it's a hockey stick. It's not like we go back to real life that we all knew on April 16th, 2021, and then all of a sudden, of course there'll be a decline. If you're allowed to go to the store, you're gonna buy something that you're not buying on a computer right now. But forever, right now, I see everybody in the comments. I wanna read these. Please leave a comment right now on social or the stream you're in on something you bought during COVID on e-commerce that you already now know, you will never go back mm -hmm. to buying in a store. Please put hashtag never going back so I can see them all. Hashtag never going back and then list or link or picture the item or right, the item that you have now switched your behavior forever, not <laughs> when we, you know, forever. So for every entrepreneur is watching, this isn't like, oh, I want to add this on for this time. I see so many people, oh yeah, Gary, I need this now for this time. Mm -hmm. No, no, this is not for this time. It's forever. No. It's forever. It it's is forever. The, forever. It's forever. My dad, what? who's fought me so hard, like we got into a huge <laughs> argument three years ago because he wanted people to front the shelves of the store during the day so it looked presentable, which was hurting us because he only had so much for payroll because we were not getting packages out as fast as I wanted, and it was a fight. I, it was when I when I say fight, it was a verbal jousting that that led to me going to a place of like, look, and this is why the business has declined since I've been gone. Like really, like hurt feelings, right? Yeah, yeah. He literally. And I know, I know how much I know how much you love your dad. The so most spirited debates are hard. I was, I was only coming because I love him, and I'm like, okay, you're gonna lose market share here. You're fighting for a front that doesn't exist anymore that's declining 25% a year regardless of what you do. I could fucking show back up in the store and be there 12 hours a day and people are gonna come and take selfies with me and buy a bottle of wine and we're still gonna fucking decline. And now, 
he literally told Brandon, my best friend who runs the store for the last, for with me the whole time and independently for almost the last 10 years, he literally says things like, I don't even give a shit. If, like he just, he, he's learned. Like it's, the, the ship has sailed. I'm trying to convince him to turn the second floor of the right. store into a sports card store. I'm not joking. <laughs> Yeah, so look, awesome. the, 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 listen, there are 96 percent of discretionary spend go into like seven buckets: H how to move, where to live, what to eat, what to wear, how to entertain, how to learn, how to heal. In ninety six percent of spend goes into these seven categories. All of these categories are going to be impacted by commerce because it is about removing friction. And again, companies I keep mentioning Amazon; they spent two billion dollars just to go from 20, 48 hours to twenty four hour Prime. So you're going to speed and, 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 and personalization are going to be key. The other thing I want to say is that, you know, forward thinkers, I, I view you, Gary, as a futurist because comments you've made about content and social and digital marketing were easily, in some instances, a decade ahead. Uh, and, and so when I think about listening to Elon Musk talk about this code freeze on autonomous vehicle, today, my relationship in a car, when I get in the car, is purely operator. 100% of the time, I'm driving the car. My son is 10 years old. When my son gets his license seven, eight years from now, the relationship for him in a car is not an operator. It's an explorer. It's a traveler. It's a, it's a student. When he gets older, business person. Natural language processing and voice-enabled digital assistants that are driving commerce for some of our most advanced Salesforce customers mean you're going to talk to a headless commerce platform, your dashboard. And as you're driving and you're getting close to Starbucks and that's where you get your coffee, the system is going to recommend, do you want your latte, you're two miles away, you say yes, you have heads up display, you have voice, so it's very safe. And by the way, by the time my son, we're at level four, level five autonomy, so he can go to sleep and go to places. What people don't realize is that this is your remote control for life. Your second biggest screen is going to be your car, because the average adult is in a commute one and a half hours a day. Now that may change because of COVID and you'll be able to work from home because of the cultural shift that we witnessed. Or but the fact or, that you can or, create it. Or, or it will become so pleasant for you to work in your yes. car. Because once it becomes that, <laughs> it doesn't look the way it looks now. I can't wait. Right. You know how much I love flying across country in my very comfy lay down first class seat, working for four hours, nobody bothering me. I might just go to a baseball oh. card store in Ohio, five hours away, so I can work Right. in my car for five hours and enjoy myself. I mean, people don't Absolutely. get where this is going. People don't get it. They're Absolutely. Like, and cars real quick on this, because I want to drill this home. Do you understand that this is like fucking out of a fucking sci-fi film for our grandparents? When they, when they were 16, <laughs> do you understand that this is fucking Star Wars shit? And we sit here, it is. and this is going to be a pager. This is gonna look like a pager to all three of us and everybody watching in 20 years, like a fucking pager. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Now remember, NASA uh, last year celebrated their 50 year anniversary of putting a man on the moon. All of the computing power they used to put a man on the moon, this has one million times more the processing and memory power. So in not quite in my lifetime, but in my father's lifetime, all of NASA's computers, and what that means is you know, humanity now has a supercomputer in their pocket. But at the same time, I want, you know, recognition. I was invited to a UN event December of last year with Vint Cerf and Sir Tim Berners-Lee, the inventor of the web and the inventor of TCP IP protocol, which is the internet. And the celebration for UN was in December last year is the first time we crossed the 50% of humanity accessing the internet. Right now, one in two of the 7.7 7 billion people on the, in the world, they don't even have access to the internet. So and by the way, by India. the way, forget I knew where you were about to go and I want to just jump in here. People in America. You know, one of the reasons, one of the reasons I got so passionate about the all-in challenge when COVID hit was people yeah. don't have access to food. Mm -hmm. You go to inner cities and and very low income areas in this country, these kids, their escapism was school in the YMCA. They're sitting at home. Absolutely. People are like, oh, they need to be homeschooled. These kids don't have fucking internet. 30% of K-12 in the U.S. doesn't have broadband access. So, you know, it's 12% it's, it's, of adults in the U.S. don't have internet access, which was shocking to me. Canada has more internet access and mobile access than U.S. So there's a lot, it's, we're privileged. The fact that we're doing this right now, the fact that, you know, we're technologists, it's, we have to be mindful that COVID and even prior to COVID, 
there are so many individuals that just don't have access to technology like we do. And it's folks like yourself with your generosity and the fact that you're always trying to educate and inspire people to understand that be grateful for what you have right now be, and give as much as you can. Uh, uh, so anyway, sorry, 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 no. Zubin. I know, I know you had an agenda. <laughs> No, there's, there's absolutely no need for me to jump in. This is uh, fantastic. Um, just one thing to mention. So a lot of what you're talking about right now, like everything, you sum it up, it's consumer behavior, right? Technology is shifting consumer behavior. Consumer expectation is shifting. People that don't have access to that technology are getting left behind. So they need access to that technology, right? Because as our, as our behavior changes, then now you look at the people that are in the audience that are listening, that have uh, online stores, they have their products in retail. What do they need to do? fact of the matter is you need to evolve. Every single person that's in the chat is a consumer. The, the, the interesting thing is you talk to a lot of people that are either selling online or they're selling at retail, whatever. And the, the most common sense things they don't do because they don't put themselves in the chair of the consumer. Even though they're a consumer, right. they buy other right. people's products. But when right. it comes to their products, they don't think about that. Right. So and, that. And you have to balance that with not creating a focus group of one, right? Absolutely. So, so I think so much of my success as I've navigated around the consumer is I don't have any beliefs when I have my business hat on. Meaning like, like I don't wanna make slime, but nine-year-old girls do. Like, by the way, one of the, I actually started talking about sports cards one year after I decided there was something there because I spent an entire year educating myself and triple checking with myself, am I trying to force this to happen because I once loved it? Or is this actually just another observation like social media, the internet, yeah. you know, it was, it, you know, Zubin to your point, not only looking at your own behavior, but what so many people in the chat make a mistake of or who are gonna watch this or listen to this later is they impose their points of view on the world, on the market, and they get destroyed. My complete neutrality on it, other than what I observe, has completely, completely impacted me. By the way, let's get very better. I drank no alcohol in high school and college because I was completely not into it, yet my first business was a wine business. <laughs> and I'm one of the most public figures in social in this 15 year window and I share nothing about my personal life. Nothing. Had I not been into this, I would not have social media accounts. On the record, had I not been a communications guy, a marketing guy, a media guy, I would probably not have social media because I would have nothing to post because I wouldn't post my family the way that 95% of people do and they're like. But life. Gary, do you know why you have so much in common with autonomous vehicles like Tesla? Because you know what signals to pay attention to. You get a shitload of Absolutely. noise. When we drive in a car, when, when I'm Absolutely. sitting there driving in the car, I see the tree, I see this, I see the sky, whatever. The vehicle drives, it knows what signals to pay attention to, not the noise. Same with you, same with people yeah. in the chat. Like people tell you shit all the yeah. time, but the key is understanding what yeah. signals matter and which ones do you do something about. Yeah, and as complicated as autonomous vehicles are, there are only four building blocks. There's the sensor building block. So you are, your, your sense and response. Then there's the analysis, decision, and actuation. And the actuation is left, right, fast, slow. It's actually very simple logic. Yeah. But you put that together, when you look at the tech stack of a company like Tesla, and which, by the way, all future businesses are going to be built like Tesla. The modularity, the ability to sense and response. It's your humility that you have and the beginner's mindset, free of prejudice, really hungry, really curious. Admit when you're wrong, adjust and sense. Again, market trends, that's in your DNA. And that's why I say you're, you're one of the most prominent futurists. I've never heard you call yourself a futurist, but in my mind, you're a futurist. And in this space, I see a lot of folks innovating in this space of common commerce. The human mind, for example, processes an image 60 times faster than text. So if you've got commerce folks thinking about augmented reality and interactive 3D, companies that are building commerce where you can take the, pro like IKEA putting furniture in your store. You take LiDAR technology in your iPad, you scan your room, and then you place furniture in your room with different color palettes and the exact size and fit appears. You're getting 66% more engagement. You're getting 40% more conversion. You're getting 35% less returns. So many of the statistics that drive the success of e-commerce is being accelerated by visual commerce, by machine learning and deep learning and very simple, today simple, again, sci-fi five years ago, but it really is here now. So 
advice to entrepreneurs who are listening and watching two things don't disqualify yourself if you're going to solve an unsolved problem again there are no experts like i see so many people worried about are they qualified to do this thing but it's an unsolved problem and in the commerce space there's a lot of opportunities for people to innovate this and, and the second thing is stay teachable this space is moving really fast really fast so the most important skill you can have is you got to read, you got to write, you got to attend conferences, you got to be active on social. If you're an introvert and it's difficult for you to create content, engage, at least watch and observe. Uh, you know, watch your coffee with commerce. That's a, another ex example of what you should stay teachable because the world two, three years from now is going to be far different, far different in this space. And by the way, it's not just consumer side because I've got Adidas, $4 billion of commerce, 80% of that is B2B. So every business, every brand wants to get close to the consumer. You're going to find this great awakening on the B2B side that says, my God, we need more investment in content and content because you find that moment of truth. You better have something that has, adds value mm -hmm. to your end user, whether it's a business buyer or a consumer. Speed to value is how you define relevance. And without relevance, you can't achieve growth. Speed to value. Can you co-create value at the speed of need? And you don't get to define the speed of needs, your customer. And I'm telling you, digital natives, you, all three of us are digital immigrants. We weren't born mobile, social, in the cloud. My 10-year-old is a digital native. All he, I mean, he knows more about surfing and connecting than, than, than I did when I was 30 <laughs> or, or maybe 40. So you have to recognize a third of humanity right now is 18 years or younger. The world is going to be Gen Z and digital natives. And man, if you don't, you can't connect with them at the right time on the right channel to the right person with the right content to that digital native world, you're a dead business. You're a dead business. 52% uh, of Fortune 500 has disappeared since year 2000. So don't think this is like small businesses that are immune. The biggest businesses in the world, half of them have died in the last, in, in the 21st century. Every 10 business day, a company falls off the S&P 500 list. No one is immune to disruption. And if you ignore commerce, you're a dead business, in my humble opinion. So let's lean into the teachable moments. Totally agree. Uh, Seth, let's drop in some questions. We've got about 10 minutes left. Let's just jump into questions from the audience. I so meant to just listen to Gary the whole time, so I apologize. This was, this, this was an opportunity for the teacher to learn, uh, to teach her to give to the student, and I, I just talked too much, so I apologize. You, you really didn't, because what was fun for me and why I was staying unusually quiet myself is you're a very excited communicator like I am myself, and you're touching on things from a macro technology standpoint that I often take for granted because I'm trying to make it so practical for everybody. But what you did, and I was listening and I was reading the comments, what you did is what I end up, you know, it's so funny. I always want to go super practical and then I always get into macro because I'm like, fuck, we can't fix this sink unless we fix the well. And if I don't get them to be not insecure anymore, they're never going to fucking do this shit anyway. And what I think you did in a technology way, which used to be more of what I used to do, as you know, is you, you're setting up the framework of like, you do understand, this is how I interpreted what just happened. Hey everybody, you do understand that this hasn't even started and everything we're actually playing with right now is minor leagues. So if you're worried about debating even going in on e-commerce, you're gonna wake up in 10 years and get fucking smacked. Yeah, 100%. Because, because it's, thank, yeah. thank you for the summary. That's exactly what I meant to say. Zubin, yeah. take it away. Let's do it. Skibum1130 asks, how do you adapt and maintain old school customers? By, by over communicating to old school customers about the changes you're making and maybe even keeping some of your old tactics just for them. We do this all the time in my companies. We change, somebody wants to be grandfathered in, it's less profitable because we changed, but we want to retain the customer. So even though we've gone full, we now communicate on Slack, we may have three clients still on Gchat. Or even though we don't do free shipping in New Jersey anymore, with Wine Library, now you gotta buy the library pass, Amazon Prime, you know, now we still keep three customers that we did free shipping in 1999. You're willing to adapt to keep a little sliver. Too many people take the philosophy of the new change and they burn the ocean with it when all you needed to do was appease seven people, not scalable, but very consumer centric. Shit, I really, I really, I really like that. Can we clip that? I've never really talked about it that way. And it's actually very right. clear to me right. that how much I do that and how important it is. 
Now take that on a tactical level. And, 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 and good so companies, good good companies understand the total lifetime value of a customer. So there's always exception based. And this isn't a light switch. This is a dimmer. You know, you don't turn off your. You know, you you gotta. You got. I always go to Gary's. You know, the reason you love your parents is because they loved you first. Just get keep continuing to give the love to your good customers. Be flexible. Right now, empathy, flexibility, generosity is what will define your brand it's, for the next ten listen, years. We can use people all the 30, are judging can, you right now. We can use the thirty-seven other other cliche great words that I love that you love. It is blindly consumer centric. It is blindly consumer. There is no world I live in that any of my thought process doesn't think why this is good for them. I don't even have the gear to think about in the micro or the operations, <laughs> what's in it for me. I'm aware that if I live for what's in it for them, that everything else will turn out okay. One of the number one things awesome. I recognized in the first two meetings I had with Zubin as he considered to sell his company to me versus somewhere else was he had so much knowledge and communication capability and wants and needs in him and that I knew one of the biggest things that I could bring to him was giving him far more exposure than he had had. Yeah. I am allocating an ungodly amount of time to this fucking show, you know, <laughs> Coffee and Commerce for for two, two reasons. Number one, Zubin. Because this is kind of what I signed up for in my mind because I knew it was important to him. Cheers to you. And number two, for the fucking 3,000 people that are watching right now, that instead of them buying some bullshit e ebook for $4,000 about e-commerce because everyone's coming in, that they're getting all of this for free. Three, I know in some way, shape, or form that that will be good for me, whether that's good for me in grandfather Zubin telling them the legacy story of Gary V, you know, uh, or in that, you know, ginger beloved in this audience buys, you know, from wine text every day, which I think she does, or, you know, Vicky J in here, you know, tells somebody to come to four D's or Ross press buys, you know, sports cards and makes money, 10 X his money. And then tells everybody that was get, like, and that that's a brand to me, bring it transactional or nothing. Cause it's just the right thing to do. That's business. That was stunned. I'm stunned. I'm stunned that you know names and individuals, knowing that your customer base is hundreds of thousands and millions. I'm, I'm reading, and you I'm, have I'm, a personal I'm, I'm, I'm reading the Tesla. I'm reading the chat. That's not the point. The point was the analogies I used against those individuals were proper. It's easy to read the chat. Yeah. It's different to know what these people are doing with you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Signal call. Amazing. Amazing. All right, Seth, what's the next question? So Val VR asks, hey guys, how would you go about relaunching an e-commerce store after being out of stock for some time because of logistics delays? What strategy would you implement to get back on top? Zoom in, I'm gonna let you take over because I've got now a, a client slot here because I was taking 15 minutes away. So Val, I love you. Audience, I love you. Zoom in, take us home. We'll talk soon. Bye guys, thanks. All right, so you're out of stock. Goes back to what uh, Vala was mentioning in terms of uh, a client earlier, um, a call that he had with Fortune 500 company. Look, sincerity, authenticity, we're talking about that. That's the, the theme of this entire episode, right? So why not continue that with the actual audience that you have? Let me tell you a story. There was a uh, prominent uh, fashion brand that uh, somewhat of a startup uh, that I purchased something for, from um, in LA some time ago. Um, last year. Anyway, four weeks in, no order status. Six weeks in, I email them, no email back. Eight weeks in, oh, I'm sorry, your product got delayed in, uh, in, in routing in China or whatever it was. Now, mind you, I bought this in uh, October so that I could wear it in November. It was like a jacket uh, when we went to uh, Thanksgiving somewhere. So now it's like December, it's January, they still haven't responded to me. Finally, they respond to me and they say, okay, look, we're sorry we made a mistake. Uh, the CEO emails me, we're going to get you credit, etc. We're in fucking July right now and no email still. So the point is like the authenticity of it, of be honest to people. You're out of stock. Why did you sell it? If Well, did you sell it to begin with and charge them? That's a different story. But if you're out of stock, explain to them what the process was. Why do people like going and buying from Empathy Wines or something like that when they show you the whole farm to table uh, mm. uh, 
uh, sourcing path because you can see the actual path that it took. Why not be honest and explain what actually happened in that entire uh, sourcing logistics uh, part of the equation and what you're going to do to rectify it and why they should come back. So over communicate and then give them a reason to come back. Don't just expect them to come back and buy from you. Give them a credit. The key is LTV. The key is customer for life. Sorry, Vala, go ahead. No, 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 I can't. There's not much for me to add to that. Trust has to be your number one core value. Now, you know, recognize people understand that the pandemic has led to massive supply chain disruption. So you might be surprised if you, through whatever channels you connect with your customers, maybe it's a newsletter, email, social, you simply state and admit that you had high demand, low inventory, and because of the pandemic, I'm assuming it's because of the pandemic, you, the company struggled, but we're back. And to, to show, you know, uh, to apologize for the inconvenience, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a promotion, there's something, you know, give, give them a reason to come back. But radical transparency, at the end of the day, totally. practice radical transparency and know that people are going to be empathetic. People are empathetic with businesses. They know everyone is struggling. No one is expecting perfection but everyone's expecting high integrity and trustworthiness. I know we keep saying this on this show, I keep mentioning it, but surprise and delight people. Yeah, exceed your expectations. Well, you used to go to retail stores, you buy a cologne or a perfume, whatever, they throw a bunch of samples in there and you're like, oh, this is awesome, right? Yeah. Even if you're not gonna use them, you just love the fact that you get that. Exceed expectations for people. This isn't just for those that have run out of inventory and their customers are upset, but even those that are actually doing really well, surprise yeah. and delight. I hate to use another cliche, but this is something Gary's been saying for a decade. He asked the question, the best marketing strategy? And his answer is two words, care more, care more. Uh, not only are you going to communicate you had low inventory, but you're going to care more and do that extra one or two steps to ensure that people come back and uh, continue to earn you with their hard earned dollars. You mentioned something earlier about personalization and I, for the audience, I just want to kind of take that home and drive it home. If you're speaking to somebody in real life and you sell uh, shirts, for example, and you're in the retail store and they, you talk to them, you find out what their style is, you get all this information from them and you go, this is the best shirt for you. This is why you should buy this shirt. That's what we're talking about in terms of personalization online. The, somebody asked earlier in terms of uh, how do I deal with my old school customers, et cetera, personalization. Don't just fucking send everybody back to the same homepage that has the same product that you're pushing. If you have an older demographic that you started with and now you're skewing lower in terms of age, well, make sure that you send that older demographic back to experiences that are for them. Right. Um, right. What have we got next, so, Seth? Right. Yeah, go right. ahead. No, I mean, the next time Zubin walks into the store and, uh, you know, the previous experience, he, he, you know, he bought the beautiful collar pink shirt that he's on, he has ah. on now. <laughs> if, the, if, the, if the personal shopper says, you know, and they look up on the tablet, they don't have to have amazing memory, that's what CRM is for, but they understand your your likes and dislikes, and you say, we have more collared shirts on sale today. I love an experience when I go back to a, a brand and they recognize who I am and they understand my preferences. That's how you keep me as a customer. If you treat me like a number, and by the way, you know, hotels is a perfect example for those of us who travel. You know, to, or airlines. I, you don't know how many times I have to tell them I prefer an aisle seat. And I am a premier member. I mean, I'm traveling, you know, 100,000 miles a year, and they still don't know my preferences in terms of where I want to sit. Anyway, remove friction, and that's how you earn people's trust. And don't over-personalize. Every call I've had with Vala, or most of them, he's had a collared shirt and a tie on, so I wore this to personalize myself for him. He wore this to personalize himself for our show, so don't over-personalize <laughs> That's right. That's, right. <laughs> That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Um, Purush Kara asks, question for Vala. What advice would you give to a technology lover grad student to get a mindset like yours? Oh, wow. Uh, remember, all of this to me happened in my 40s, so you're 20 years ahead of me. Uh, the mistake I made as an introvert is that I, I didn't realize uh, networking was about giving. So... I, I think resumes are dying. So if you're a grad school, you're looking for work, the traditional resume and your updated LinkedIn profile for most innovative companies, they're looking at your digital footprint and your digital exhaust. So your brand, by the way, as a former CMO, people would say, what, what does brand mean? 
Your brand is what people say about you when you're not in the room. Now, the room is the web, and the web are people, and people are more social. Therefore, the room is more social. So people are going to learn about you and talk about you all the time, especially for a company. Now, as an individual looking to build a career, your brand is your digital footprint plus your digital exhaust. So as a student, I would say, Google yourself and ask, would I hire me? What's the first thing that pops? Are you hashtag failing brands? What's that video about you, the photo about you? What's the tone and sentiment about the words you use? Are you using remarkable words? So companies are using machine learning powered recruitment applications to determine your, your EQ, not your competence and the things you did, but the cultural fit for you in a company. So to have that mindset, knowing your brand is what people talk about you when you're not in the room, you must live a recommendable life. So when people are talking about you, they're recommending things about you. He's a nice guy. He's trustworthy. He's fun to be around. He's smart. He's giving. Are you living a recommendable life? And that social and digital footprint is really the web is your resume. So the mindset of giving and caring and knowing that you will be judged by your presence, both physical and digital, and more and more in the future, digital means that you have to be super mindful and uh, in terms of how you present, represent yourself. Uh, live a recommendable life. Live a that's the best advice I can give and, and, and start giving. Giving means writing, giving means podcast, giving means volunteering at community. Don't wait for people to tap you on the shoulder to get engaged. Get in the game. You can't score on the bench or in the stands. Suit up and get in the game. And that's what I didn't do early in my career. But over time, I learned from my mistakes. Uh, doers will make mistakes. Smart doers make original mistakes. So, uh, so learn from it. Keep doing. Keep falling. Keep getting back up. But uh, live a recommendable life. Brilliant. All right. Let's get a couple more questions in here. So Nishan Tupal asks, hi, Team Gary, what do you suggest if I'm looking to start a fresh e-commerce business at this time and set something up while this pandemic is on? Basically make money and set up base for future. Let me jump in, Vala, and yeah. then I'll uh, hand yeah. it off to you. So uh, I got a couple issues with this question. Uh, <laughs> the number one thing is, look, I agree with you. Leverage this opportunity. Um, and, and when I say leverage this opportunity, what I'm saying is, that there are a lot of opportunities that you can focus on right now to build a future for yourself. Now, what do, do I have an issue with this? The part about making money, right? Because when I think about making money, I'm thinking about like EBITDA or net income. I'm thinking like profit. Whereas I think right now the focus should be not profit. Uh, I We get hit up all the time. We get hit up by different types of people that are starting companies, starting D to C brands, et cetera. And you look at their financials, and you're like, their, or their financial projections, and they've got salaries, and they've got this and that. And you're like, okay, the amount of money you're raising isn't even going to get you to three months. It's not even going to take you to market. The key right now, in my mind, is invest in your future. If you're doing it with bulk, a bunch of people, take that time and invest. So yes, do it right now, and I'll explain to you what, what I think you should do. But the point that I'm making here is don't think about it as making money right now but laying the bricks for your future. Now, in terms of the fact, look, e-commerce is hot, everybody's trying to get into it, et cetera. But it's also, as everybody's been getting into it over the last few years, competition is up, the market's saturated, you're not just gonna go in and make a quick buck like you were able to five years ago, three years ago, whatever. And the key to sustainability and longevity is to lean into what you're passionate about. You're gonna have more shitty days than you're gonna have good days. Or the shitty days you're going to feel more than the good days so you got to be passionate about what you're doing what are you actually passionate about in your life and then figure out a way do i have the ability to build a unique product and take it to market or do i take something that exists and make it better and take it to market but again you got to love that fucking thing you got to love that space <laughs> you got to think about i mean the way i think about it is like for me if i were to take a product to market it'd probably have something to do with soccer because what I read when I'm not reading about work, whatever, is I'm following Arsenal Football Club. But my point is, like, if I were to do that, that's what I would do because it's fun and I enjoy it and I have a lot of depth of knowledge in it. So lean into that. Sorry, Vala. Go ahead. No, that's, that's brilliant advice. It's, it, it was a, it's a complicated question to answer. Um, you know, um, 
It is. Uh, just know it, it can be a unique product. It could be, as you've been said, something that remember Google was the 21st search engine to come out in 1998, 21st. And uh, you know, they're, they're a trillion dollar market cap company. So, you know, you don't, you, you, although I don't think better saying this is necessarily disruptive innovation, um, you can have incredible success and it doesn't have to be the first product or something that's super unique. Uh, fo following your passion, I think is good advice, but uh, you have to have discipline and you do have to invest in yourself first before you can help others. It's all about creating value. Uh, so it's, if the question was something quick during the pandemic to make money. I don't know enough about the person who's asking the question to give him, you know, specific advice, but uh, add value. Uh, and the only way to do that is to, again, invest in yourself and then understand situational awareness is also important. Understanding the holes that exist around you and how you can fill that with the skills and competency and capabilities that you have, that's only unique to you. But I got to tell you, you got to work hard. You're not, no one's going to give you anything and competition is fierce and uh, talent loses when they stop working hard. So you got to put in, uh, it's, it's a 10 year commitment to building something of success, 10 years. So there is no, you know, overnight success usually for most takes many, many years of failure, uncertainty, rejection, hard work, and if you don't have that grit and persistence, you're not going to make it. Vala, this was brilliant. Thank you so much for sharing your insight with us. I'm going to go back and watch this myself because there's so much that you put in there that I want to take notes on. Um, honestly, this was fantastic. We, uh, our intent with Coffee and Commerce um, is to pu uh, push the conversation forward about commerce. And I think we've certainly done that today. Thank you so much for your time, Vala. Looking forward to doing this again with you soon. That, thank you, Zubin. I learned from you and Gary and your team. Uh, uh, I can't wait to see the trajectory of commerce, uh, Vanna Commerce. And, uh, you know, by the way, of all the things that Gary said about you, dude, your weekend's made. <laughs> you know, <laughs> drop the mic and go celebrate. <laughs> yeah, except That's I got a meeting with praise. him right now. Yeah, I know. I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So go do, go do your thing. And thanks for, the, thanks for the invitation. It was an honor. Thank you, sir. You're the best. Thanks, brother. Bye-bye. Talk to you. Bye.